All right, what's the story? I've watched 10 seasons of Robot Wars back to back, and now I'm starting to see Craig Charles in my dreams, Sean Johnson here. And welcome to my big dumb internet show where I review a collection of games in order of release and then rank them all from worst to best. And today's video is on every single DC Comics game released on the PlayStation. I knew when I started this channel I wanted to do a ranking on every DC Comics and Marvel Comics game on the PlayStation, but thanks to the law of alphabetical order, we're going to be starting with the DC Comics video today, and then we're going to have the Marvel video at a later date, probably in the near future. DC Comics have a pretty rocky history of video games. For every NES Batman or Arkham game, you get a Green Lantern, or Catwoman, or Aquaman, or pretty much every Superman game. Please somebody make a good Superman game, we've had over 40 years to do it. But today we are narrowing down the scope and we're just going to look at DC's output on the original PlayStation. So by the end of the video we should be able to determine what is the worst and what is the best DC game on the system, as well as everything in between. So before we start I'd just like to list off a few quick disclaimers. An emulator was used to capture all game footage, so if you see any weird visual errors please be aware, that's probably why. For consistency, all games shown today will be the North American versions, no PAL or Japanese exclusive games this time around. While the end goal here is to offer a critical review and ranking of each game, the video is mostly for fun, so if I'm not a fan of a game you enjoy or likewise I enjoy a game that you hate, just remember it's just some dumb guy's opinion on the internet, so remember to have fun and don't take it too seriously. And lastly, in the interest of your time, if there is a particular review that you would like to watch or just want to skip ahead to the ranking, the timestamps for each are listed below, so go ahead, skip. You won't hurt my feelings. Okay, with that out of the way, we can now begin. So last time we did this, it was every Disney game on the PlayStation, and we had a grand total of 36 games to get through with that. A frankly insane number that I still don't think I fully recovered from. So this time, take a guess. How many DC games do you think got released on the original PlayStation? Yeah, just four. I thought there would have been more as well. So without further ado, here is a review of every DC Comics game released on the original PlayStation in order of release. And uh, PS, I hope you like Batman. So the first DC Comics game released on Sony's console was a port of the arcade beat em up Batman Forever the arcade game. Now this was Acclaim Entertainment's first ever arcade game and was first released in arcades in the summer of 1996 and was then later ported over to the PlayStation in December of that year. This here is a side scrolling beat em up similar to games like Final Fight or Streets of Rage. You move along a linear path, you beat up lots of bad guys and you occasionally pick up weapons and items from time to time. Simple, classic gameplay. This game does opt for some fancy 1996 graphics with these big digitized character and enemy sprites. Now there's some cool scaling effects for the characters in the backgrounds, not that impressive nowadays but I'm sure this was pretty eye catching when it was first released. Over on the PlayStation the game takes a bit of a hit on the visuals. This game does look pretty close to the arcade version but the sprites are missing a bunch of frames here in the PS1. It's not a bad port but certainly not as nice as the arcade version comparatively. So here's the thing with Batman Forever the arcade game, it's just... One of the most insane games I've ever played. The whole thing just exudes this almost manic energy. I mean, like, look at what's happening on the screen right now. Do you know what's going on? I don't. I've no idea. The game is like the definition of chaos. It moves so quickly. Enemies are coming out of everywhere. Items and effects are exploding onto the screen every few seconds. Batman's suddenly powering up out of nowhere. All the enemies are now tiny. I'm now tiny. There's now five Batmans. I guess I'll do my best to try explain what's happening here. After playing the game briefly to warm up, I actually had to read the manual to figure out half the stuff that was going on. So the game only uses three buttons, right? You've got a jump button, a punch button, and a kick button. You can block by pressing the punch and kick button simultaneously, and if you walk into enemies, you initiate a grab. Items are picked up automatically by walking over them, and you can pick up certain items to throw at enemies as well. When you've got an item equipped, you can use them by pressing the punch button, and each character also has a few special moves that can be inputted with fighting game style commands, quarter circle punch, quarter circle kick, that kind of thing. So far it all sounds pretty standard, right, but let's move on to actually performing combos in this game. 
you don't actually have any combo commands in Batman Forever. Your ability to use combo attacks depends on the power of the meter below your health bar. When you kill enemies, they usually drop these power pickups. Collecting them fills up the bar. Now, if the meter is filled up at all, your standard attack string increases while also draining the meter slowly while attacking. Now, if you manage to fill up the bar completely, Batman then powers up a level. Next to the power meter, you will see a number which represents your current power level. It starts at one, but when you fill the meter, it increases and in level up to a maximum level of three. Now, at each level, your combos get longer and more powerful. By the time you're level three, you're just mashing the kick button and absolutely battering lads. It's mad. The power meter here also affects your items as well. Most of the item pickups in this game are different bat gadgets. You can expect to see classics like batarangs, hook shots, etc., but also tasers, stun bombs, and other weird pickups as well. These items also change depending on your power level, so like level 1 could be a basic attack, while level 2 could add homing to the item and level 3 could power up the damage a bit further. Long story short, you want to try to keep your power level as high as possible at all times. I don't actually think this is too bad of a system for a beat em up really, but like, I know this genre is pretty much known for button bashing, but this game is like, the king of button bashing. All the weird combos and cool shit that's happening on screen, it's all just performed by mashing either punch or kick, and as long as your parameter is high enough, there's really nothing else you need to be doing. Everything looks flashy here, but there's barely any depth to the gameplay at all. The pure definition of all style, no substance. So look, I wouldn't say this is a good beat-em-up at all, but still, I kind of enjoyed my time playing this between how fast the game is, the number of enemies on screen, the items, the effects all over the place, the ridiculous power-up animation that takes 5 seconds and happens nearly once or twice every 30 seconds. The game is just this cheesy, over-the-top, unapologetic mess, and it's kind of fun to take part in the spectacle. The game even has these cheesy clips that play when you're getting awards after each level complete with an announcer hyping them up. Super knockout bonus. I just love how dumb this is. You can also choose one of these awards to select a power-up to carry over to the next level as well. I had to look up the manual for what these do since there's no way of really telling what they do from the pictures alone, but they do give you things like items, a temporary double damage, points multipliers, etc. Also look at the character select screen, it's so weird. I suppose now is a good time as any to talk about the characters. You have the choice of playing as either Batman or Robin, and the characters each have their own different fighting styles with unique combos. Now the characters kind of control a bit awkwardly, and because your attacks are changing all the time in line with your power levels, you never really feel like you're in too much control of what's happening on the screen. Now I found playing Batman was fine for the most part, but Robin just felt so awkward to play as. Every attack just felt kind of weird to execute, really unnatural by beat em up standards, and I wasn't really a fan of playing him at all. Also, it probably goes without saying, but the game can be played co-op with two players, but with how hectic and busy the screen is with just a single player, I can't imagine playing this with two players is an enjoyable experience at all. Another thing is that this game is also really, really hard. Enemies go down pretty easily, but your characters take so much damage from enemy attacks, and enemies can take off nearly half your health in a single combo, and you can easily get stuck between or rushed by enemies, so it's not uncommon to die often in this game seemingly out of nowhere. The problem is that the game only really gives you a limited number of continues too, so even though the game is really short, it can be a struggle to make it to the end with how tough the later levels can get. There are a few bosses here and there, but most of them aren't too interesting. You do get to fight Two-Face and the Riddler later on, but all the bosses up until that point are kind of dull or just annoying to fight, honestly. On the presentation side, once again, I enjoy the game's weird visual design, but the environments for each level can feel a bit repetitive. The game does stick to a dark colour palette, which makes sense because it's a Batman game, but I think the levels could have still had a bit more variety to make them stand out from one another. The music for this game is equally chaotic, it's really loud and pretty obnoxious honestly. There's tons of sound effects going off all the time, all the enemies are yelling, everything is exploding, you have an announcer screaming combos at you. I'm not going to say it's very good, but I guess it complements the madness happening on screen, so it works in its own weird way. Batman Forever the Arcade Game is not a very good game at all, but I do kind of respect just how obnoxious and stupid it all is. I guess you could say it's kind of like the Joel Schumacher movies in that regard, silly and entertaining, but seriously lacking in depth. I'm glad I played it at least once just to experience the insanity of it all, but it is still kind of trash. Guilty pleasure trash. <laughs>
Next up, we have the video game tie-in for the infamous Batman and Robin movie, released in 1998 for the PlayStation and developed by Probe Entertainment, once again published by Acclaim. If you've never seen the 1997 movie Batman and Robin, you've probably at least seen somebody make fun of it on the internet before. Batman and Robin is my favourite kind of bad movie because even though it's complete trash, it's enjoyable trash. It's so bad that it elevates itself into being enjoyable because of that. And I'd take that over a boring or generic movie any day of the week, easily. Seven minutes. Never leave the cave without it. The video game tie-in on the other hand, I'm going to be upfront, this is an awful game. It would have been bad when it was first released in 1998, but by today's standards, it's practically unplayable. But at the same time, this happens to be one of the most ambitious games ever released on the PlayStation, and also one of the most interesting Batman games ever made too. This is one of the few Batman games I can think of that really taps into the whole detective side of the character. The goal in this game is to prevent Mr. Freeze and his goons from committing crimes around Gotham City. But unlike most games, this game doesn't just bring you to a level or tell you what your objectives are. Instead, you need to find clues and then with these clues, piece together the information to find out where the next crimes are going to happen. So where do you find clues? Well, you've got to go explore Gotham City to find them, which sounds pretty normal so far. But the thing is, Batman and Robin is a fully 3D open world game that allows you to explore Gotham City both by vehicle and on foot. Now this is an open world 3D Batman game on the PlayStation just one year after the first Grand Theft Auto and a whole year before Driver came out which didn't even let you explore on foot. This here is actually so incredibly ambitious and ahead of its time and to be honest the city doesn't even look that bad at all. I mean sure the draw distance isn't that great but I mean that's to be expected honestly but the buildings look good, there's decent variety across the city, there's plenty of vehicles on the road and the size of the map you have to explore is huge for the time. There's even pedestrians walking around and you can even come across crimes and muggins and pull over to stop them. I mean it's crazy to see them attempt this on the PlayStation with such a high level of detail and actually do a pretty good job, honestly. So to collect clues, you need to roam around the city, search crime scenes, beat up goons, harassing civilians, etc. Now with these clues, you can either go to the back cave or access any number of the terminals available around the city to analyze the different clues for information. Now you can magnify, enhance, combine clues to find more information. And once you've pieced together a crime, its location and the time that it takes place, you can mark out the location on your map and arrive to stop it before it happens. As just mentioned, time actually plays an important factor into this game too. Batman and Robin uses an in-game timer to simulate real-time passing, which means you've always got to be one step ahead of the crimes before they actually happen, because if you didn't get enough clues to figure out a crime is going to happen at the jewellery store at 8 o'clock and it's already half 8, well, now you're one step behind catching Mr. Freeze and putting him behind bars for good. Usually you'd want to use any spare time you have before a crime starts to find additional clues for later, but you also have the option to advance time if you just want to get started with an objective right away. As a concept for a Batman game, this is actually really cool. Explore Gotham, do some detective work, analyze your work in the lab, drive to the crime and then beat up the bad guys. Actual Batman shit. But it's not just Batman, you can also play the entire game as Robin and Batgirl too, each with their own stats and unique vehicles as well. But in spite of all this ambition, the fun concept, the giant Gotham City to explore, the multiple playable characters, the game behind it all is awful. Absolute trash. This is trash! Think of a game with the worst controls you've ever experienced. Batman and Robin on the PS1 is probably worse than that. This has got to be some of the stiffest character control ever seen in a game. Getting Batman to do anything is such a struggle. Combat is a complete and total mess. There's actually a deep combo system in this game, but every attack is so awkwardly delayed it's not even worth bothering with. You've got to press a button to swap between detective and fighting mode, but detective mode is also how you jump and use gadgets. There's also an input modifier that changes your normal attack buttons to different blocks and dodges. There's like 10 buttons for fighting in this game, and none of it works, it's just a complete and total mess. Trying to just move Batman is a fight within itself. There's a button to toggle between walking and running and neither movement mode gives you any precise control over the character. The game uses these fixed camera angles almost like a survival horror game but the controls here feel worse than even something like Resident Evil. Not only that but this game expects you to do some basic platforming as well. Jumping in this game is the fucking worst. You can both jump and glide to cover a bit more distance but you barely get any height out of your jump and you also can't climb anything so you have to make sure you land right on top of each and every platform. 
The simple act of just running and jumping over a gap in this game feels so bad and it's so easy to mess up and cause you to repeat a bunch of parts over again. I don't even know what to say about Batman's glide animation, it's just, it's so stupid. Look at him go, not a care in the world. The bad controls move over to using gadgets and navigating menus as well, everything here is just so incredibly cumbersome, trying to aim and use any of your gadgets is pretty much impossible outside of the first person aiming mode, and it's so easy to accidentally use a gadget instead of punching since the input for using a gadget and punching is the same depending on whether you're in detective or fight mode, the whole thing is just a mess honestly. Surprisingly though the driving isn't too bad, it's not good but it is light years ahead of the character controls. You'll probably end up smashing into friendly vehicles and getting stuck when trying to reverse a whole lot, but actually navigating the city and getting from point A to B is one of the better things about this game. When you do eventually get to the location of your crime, you enter into what is basically an enclosed level, where you have to beat up a bunch of goons and solve some puzzles to prevent a crime. This is where all the game's problems come together. You take the awful movement and combat and now you mix it up with some confusing level design and bad cram camera angles and you've got a recipe for disaster. Enemies can spawn out of nowhere, jewelry stores have hidden passages and lifts that rise up and down out of the ground spawning more enemies, you can even get permanently stuck in locations and need to restart the game. It's just, it's just, it's just a mess. Also there was this alarm going off during every mission I played and I could never find a way to turn it off, it was like it was just made to give people headaches. I just can't see how anybody could enjoy playing this game, it's like it's actively fighting against you. Anytime you think you're having a good time, the game will very quickly remind you that actually no, you're not having a good time. Stop that. I think this game is a classic case of over ambition. The game clearly has a bunch of great ideas and some of them are implemented really well. I think the graphics look pretty good, Gotham is a fun city to explore and even with the poor draw distance, it looks really good for 1998 in my opinion. The characters look good and they even have some fun cape physics. The music when you don't have an alarm blaring over it is really moody and uses some of the tracks from the movie. The detective gameplay and the use of the open world with the need to monitor a clock in real time is really cool and way ahead of its time for a console game. It's just when it comes to actually playing it, it's awful. They try to add way too many things to the gameplay and because of that everything here comes off as unfinished and half baked. They made this huge open world with tons of places to explore and missions to complete and you won't want to do any of it because it's simply just unfun to play. What the fuck is this? I don't know if it's a case that they didn't have enough time to fix the issues or they just weren't ready to attempt a game of this scope. I mean this did actually come out a year after the movie so I get the feelings the devs just might have bit off more than they could chew and they ended up having to release the game sooner rather than later at this stage. I think Batman and Robin deserves some credit though just for the ambition and scope of what they wanted to achieve with this game. It took years for the open world Arkham games to even come close to achieving the vision of what this game set out to do, and even those games don't allow you to interact with normal civilians, prevent petty crimes, or piece together the crimes by yourself, so Batman and Robin is still ahead of its time in a lot of ways. It's just a shame that all these great ideas happen to exist within one of the worst playing games on the PlayStation, period. Game number 3 is Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, released in the year 2000 and developed by Kemco with Ubisoft on publishing duties this time around. This game is based on the fantastic animated series of the same name, Batman Beyond. This was a cool series set in the future, imagine Batman fused with cyberpunk and sci-fi themes and this is the end result. It was a great show and like many, cancelled way too soon. There's tons of potential for a great game with a series like Batman Beyond, but unfortunately what we got here is one of the worst beat em up games ever conceived. In Batman Beyond you play as 16 year old Terry McGuinness in Neo Gotham. Now Terry has taken over the mantle of Batman and is now mentored by an elderly Bruce Wayne. 
Similarly to Batman Forever, this is another beat-em-up. The whole of the gameplay here is just walking around small linear locations and just wailing on all the bad guys that show up until you're allowed to move on to the next screen. Rinse and repeat until the level is done. But while Batman Forever was a bad game full of weird excess, Batman Beyond is a bad game, but also just incredibly dull. Batman Beyond has a few problems, but its first and most major issue is that it fails the most basic rule of a beat-em-up. It's gotta be fun beating enemies up. In this game, you have access to a basic punch and kick attack. Now, you can jump, but you can't actually attack while jumping in this game, which is really weird for beat-em-up. It's pretty much just used for platforming, of which there is very little in this game, so it's pretty much never used at all. So in any normal beat-em-up, you could go up to an enemy, press the punch button three or four times and pull off a nice, simple combo. This game does not work like that. You press punch, you punch, you press kick, you kick, and that's it. There's no set combos here. You just gotta try to alternate your basic punch and kick attacks and hope for the best. Now you do get access to a few gadgets as well. You get bat discs, which do very little damage, a staff used for clearing enemies with an AOE attack, and some nunchucks, which can be charged for a powerful attack. Unfortunately, these items are nearly useless since your punch and kick attacks are just way more effective than any of the items. And a big issue with this game is that enemies don't really get stun locked when you're hitting them. So almost 80% of the attacks in this game result in you just getting hit anyway. And this game is also kind of cheap and hard too. So the only way to play it effectively is to just try spam whatever attack is likely to do the most damage while also avoiding taking any possible damage as well. But wait, that's only the first set of attacks. This game actually gives you access to four different movesets. Each moveset is selected by choosing a different bat suit brought up by pressing select during gameplay. You start in the basic suit, which has all of the additional gadgets, but there's also an offensive, defensive, and agility type suit as well. Offensive takes away all your gadgets, but actually makes your basic attacks pull off a small combo string. This would be fine if you could stun lock enemies, but since you don't, you just get hit all the time using it, so it's pretty much useless. Also, it lets you use this awful crouch kick, which is a thing for some reason. The agility suit allows you to double jump, which helps you in no way while fighting. You move a little bit faster and your attacks come out a little bit quicker as well. And you also get this weird running kick attack that sometimes hits enemies, but I mean, still, it's, it's not good, but it is one of the more effective suits for spamming attacks, at least. The defensive suit is ironically probably the best suit offensively. This suit gives you two small shields and the suit has a basic punch and kick attack, but also allows you to perform a small punch with the shield when you press punch with a directional input at the same time. This does good damage and allows you to keep a little distance with enemies, so this is easily one of the most effective attacks in the game. I know, this crappy attack. This, this is the best we got. This suit also gives you a powered up block. And yeah, I forgot to mention, there is a block button in this game as well, but most of the other suits can't even block most attacks, only this one can. So as you can see, the defensive suit is probably the best choice in most situations. And this is the game, it's really boring, broken combat, long levels, fighting the same enemies over and over again, fight an awkward mini boss or two with no interest in mechanics, just the same shit over and over, spread out over five really bland levels. It's miserable. And I hate this because I love Batman Beyond and I love beat em up games and this somehow manages to be one of the worst Batman and beat em up games ever made at the same time. Like how do you mess up a beat em up in the year 2000, seriously? I think this game just reeks of laziness, like I know this genre isn't exactly known for its innovation, especially during the 2000s, but how a show with a premise as cool as Batman Beyond ends up with dull locations like this for levels, I just don't know. Most of the fights take place in small rooms, every repeating enemy you kill usually spawns another, and then another, and then another, it just drags on for so long. And some of these enemies are really, really annoying to fight too. Some of them spam projectiles, some of them fly away and have awkward hitboxes to try connect with. And as soon as you kill one annoying enemy, you know another is just gonna spawn in right away. And then another, and then another. There's pretty much nothing redeemable about this game. I mean, it has a loose story, but it's just still images with no effort done to make any of it interesting. The music kind of veers towards an industrial metal kind of sound, and it's fine for the most part. It certainly doesn't do anything to save the levels, but at least it's not grating. Genuinely, my favorite thing about this game is probably the loading screen artwork, just because it reminds me of how stylish the animated series was. I never thought I'd see the day where I thought the load screen was the best part of a game, but here we are. 
I guess I should also mention that there is a time attack mode, but it's just to see how quickly you can beat three normal enemies, so it's a complete waste of time. Also, this game doesn't even have a two-player mode, a beat-em-up without a two-player mode. What does this game think it is? Final Fight for the SNES? It wishes. So yeah, this is a truly awful beat-em-up. It's lazy, it's dull, and it's really hard too for all the wrong reasons. Just a truly unfun video game, and it's a terrible shame that something as good as Batman Beyond had to be associated with it. The last DC Comics game released on the PlayStation is Batman Gotham City Racer developed by Sinister Games and once again published by Ubisoft in the year 2001. So far we've looked at three Batman games, three terrible Batman games. So this is the last chance for DC Comics and Batman to redeem themselves on the PlayStation and does Gotham City Racer succeed? No, of course not. Now with a name like Gotham City Racer, you'd be tricked into thinking this was a racing game, but this game probably shares more in common with Crazy Taxi than any racer you've ever played. Now Gotham City Racer is based on the new Batman Adventures. This was the animated series that took place in between Batman the Animated Series and Batman Beyond. Now the bulk of this game is the story mode, which tasks you with completing 52 different missions. Now these missions could be driving from one location to another within a time limit, tailing villains without losing them or getting too close, or just straight up shooting them with batarangs until they blow up, a thing that Batman does often, I guess. These missions take place in an open world Gotham City. Now the map is split up into multiple different areas that can be accessed at any time, but any time you move to a new area of the city, you can expect there to be a lengthy load time while transitioning. Now, most of the missions take place in a single area, but some of them can see you driving all over the city, sometimes between two or three entire load areas. Now, on paper, I think there's some ideas for a fun game here. As mentioned, there is no racing in this game whatsoever. I think a Batman racer would be really fun, but to be honest, the racing game wouldn't suit the character at all. But a game where you do drive around an open world Gotham City completing missions, almost like Driver or something, that could be really cool. Well, unfortunately, this is a Batman game on the PlayStation, so that means it has a myriad of issues holding the game back from capitalizing on any potentially good ideas here. I guess we'll start with the driving. Um, it's bad. It's really bad. This manages to have driving controls that are both too stiff and too loose at the same time. Turning corners in this game is so awkward. The Batmobile is just fighting with you every turn you take. You gotta really commit to getting the Batmobile around a corner cleanly in this game. It just feels awkward and unnatural. And even just trying to move in a straight line, the control suddenly changes from being way too stiff to being really sensitive and loose when you're trying to make even just a tiny adjustment to the car. Now, I got used to the controls after a few missions, and you can certainly make do with them, but it's never a fun experience. You can also easily get caught in the level geometry, which just adds more to the frustration of everything. Of course, since you're driving the Batmobile, you do get access to a few different gadgets. Now, you can boost by holding down the circle button, which drains a meter. The boost works as expected, just make sure to only use it on straights because if you try steering while boosting, you'll be off the road in seconds. For enemies, you've got access to two front attacks and back attacks mapped to each of the shoulder buttons respectively. Now, for enemies in front of you, you have an infinite batarang attack which pretty much just functions as a machine gun and rockets which are limited but do a good chunk of damage. For your back attacks, you've got an oil slick and smoke screen, but after playing through this entire game, I never once needed to use these attacks. The rare time an enemy car would be behind me, the AI is so bad, it's better to just ignore them and focus on your objective instead. So with just two attacks, the combat in this game is very limited. Enemy cars have a bit more variety in their attacks, but it really just comes down to dodging projectiles or avoiding something that they dropped on the road. There's also pickups you can get while driving, stuff to replenish your health, extend mission time, refill your boost and rockets, that kind of thing. It's pretty basic, but when you add the awkward driving controls into the mix, it just drains away whatever fun there is to be had here. 
Things only get worse when you actually look at the open world we have to drive around. They managed to build a really big Gotham City map that's essentially the same thing over and over again. Lots of straights and lots of sharp turns, almost no variety in road layouts across the entire city. No matter where it is that you're driving, it's all the exact same and none of it is good. I could be showing you footage from any part of the game right now and you might think it's just footage of the same mission. And it's so ugly. I get what they were trying to go for here, making the game world kind of match with the style of the animated series, but everything is so ugly and lacking in detail. There is barely anything on the roads either. You see very few civilian vehicles and that's probably for the best because you and the AI can get tangled up on them really easily. The draw distance and popping is horrendous in this game. Gotham City is just ugly and boring to drive around. You'd hope there would be some good music to make up for it, but it really is just a series of short, poorly looped tracks that suit the scene but can only last 30 seconds and then go silent for a couple of seconds and then re-loop again. It's really awkward and jarring and distracting more than anything. So driving is bad and the city is ugly and boring, but don't worry, we've got 52 missions to spice things up. You move through each mission one after another in a linear format. As mentioned before, there's a few mission types, driving to a location, tailing an enemy, or defeating an enemy, and uh, that's it. You're basically playing three different game types across 52 missions in an awful open world with bad driving controls. This is peak PS1 Batman, everybody. Now, 52 missions sounds like a lot, but the missions in this game can take anywhere from 20 seconds to around three minutes, depending on what it is that you're doing. And honestly, most of them take easily under a minute to complete. The missions themselves generally aren't hard, but there are a few more annoying things that you need to get used to if you want to succeed. The directional icon on the top of the screen, just forget about it. It does point to your objective, but if you want to make it around the maze like Gotham City, your minimap here is your best friend. You need to study this closely to make sure you're taking the right path, and unfortunately, it is way too zoomed in. It's so zoomed in that you can often think that you're taking the right path and end up in a dead end with no way of being able to tell in time. Another issue is that during different missions, the game randomly blocks off half the roads that you can take. I guess these are here to try guide you through a set path, but you can't see them coming up ahead of time thanks to the zoomed in map, so you think you're taking the right path, but then it just happens to be blocked for this particular mission. The only way I could effectively path a route during this game was to study the full map briefly before a mission starts. But there's no way to bring up the map mid-mission, so this really is your only chance to kind of get a good grasp of the paths that are ahead. And even then, the path that you're trying to take from the map might just happen to be blocked off for this mission. It's, it's the worst. The game does try to add some story to each of the missions to help move the game along, but it does this in such a lazy way that it's almost laughable. Sinister Games were able to use a bunch of clips for any animated show, and there is a good amount here, but the game uses these clips out of context to essentially just make up a mission to give you something to do. For example, you could watch a short clip with Joker and Harley Quinn, it will cut off and then suddenly they've escaped and now you're pursuing them in the Batmobile. Now this isn't what happens in the show at all, but the fact that the two characters are in this clip is enough reason to base a mission around this. No missions in the game reflect any events in the show. It's just like, well, here's Mr. Freeze, you've now got to drive here, you've also got to drive here, now you've got to drive here, and now you fight him. Now he's in Arkham, good job. It's just a quick clip and then a series of quick repetitive missions until you get to the next one. There's one particularly bad case of this. Towards the end of the game, there is a mission that starts with a clip of Scarecrow knocking Batgirl off a building. Now in the show, this is the scene where Batgirl dies. She falls from the sky, lands on a car that's been driven by her father, Commissioner Gordon, and then dies in his arms. It's one of the most shocking and emotionally hefty scenes in the entire series, especially by kid show standards. But in the game, you see her falling off the building. It then cuts away, and then you're in the Batmobile tasked with driving her to the Batcave for medical attention. So you do that, you crash into a load of walls, collect time pickups to extend her ability to not die, I guess. And then you complete the mission and she's grand. What the fuck, why would they do that? It's clear nobody designing the missions bothered to actually watch the show, it's just so lazily cobbled together. Even the little quality symbol that used to pop up at the start of TV shows happens to appear at the beginning of the game, so maybe they ripped the scenes right off the telly, who knows? There is actually two short missions where you get to play as Batgirl on her bike, but it controls worse than the Batmobile somehow and has all the same attacks, so it's more of the same, but just worse I guess. I'm glad it's only two missions I guess, outside of that you are stuck in the Batmobile for the rest of the story. 
Now there is an extra mode called Patrol, which lets you play as both Batman and Batgirl, but now also Robin and Nightwing too. This mode is just driving around trying to blow up as many villains as you can in a set limit. It's nothing that you haven't done already in the story mode. And the new characters once again control worse and have the same attacks as Batman. So this mode is pretty much just a waste of time really. Now there is a two player version of patrol mode which might be a bit more fun since you can select any of the villain cars and these do have some changes in their weapons but that's not really going to fix any of the issues preventing the game from being fun in the first place and I mean good luck trying to get someone to play to switch it. In all, Batman Gotham City Racer is another terrible use of the Batman license, a somewhat decent concept marred by, well, everything in the game really. It's just an awkward, repetitive, unfun driving game, and a fitting end to what's got to be one of the worst run of video games for a single character in video game history. Well, there you go, there was a review of every single DC Comics game released on the PlayStation, or should I say, every Batman game released on the PlayStation. That wasn't really the intention of the video, but eh, two birds at one stone, I'll take it. Those games were pretty bad though, it was probably lucky that we only seen four releases on the console the way things were going. Four does seem like a pretty small number though, I mean surely there has to have at least been some other DC game released on competing consoles around the same time. Oh no. I guess this really was the dark times for DC games. It is weird though that the only other DC game released on home consoles during that era managed to miss out on the PlayStation though. Or did it? So for those who aren't familiar with Superman 64, this is generally considered to be not just the worst superhero game ever made, not just the worst game on the N64, but one of the worst games, period. The game was developed by a French company called Titus, who are long since out of business, but in their time as a company managed to pump out bad game after bad game. It was really quite impressive. So Superman launched on the N64 in 1999 to scathing reviews, but actually ended up selling pretty well well enough to look at porting the game over to the PlayStation. Now, to do this, Titus tasked Blue Sky Studios, the developers of Vectorman, of all things, to port the game over to the PlayStation. Titus recently acquired Blue Sky as a studio, so this was one of their first big projects under them. Since the N64 game was an open world video game, the developers found trouble trying to directly port that same game over to the PlayStation, so decided to try build the game from scratch instead. I'm sure this also had nothing to do with how bad the original game was, but sure look, anything to make the game a bit better. So Blue Sky basically created and completed a whole new Superman game for the PlayStation. Sure, it was mostly based off the previous game, but everything here from the levels to the controls were brand new and built ground up for PlayStation hardware. This game was finished and nearing its 2000 release date when disastrously, Titus and Blue Sky lost the Superman license before the game managed to release, causing the game to be cancelled. Before this, they had printed advertisements for the game, made TV commercials, and even pre-sold a bunch of pre-orders, all of which caused them to lose a ton of money. Titus eventually had to close Blue Sky Studios due to financial troubles in 2001, no doubt in part to the disastrous cancellation of this game. Now the game was finished and internet legends tell the possibility of there being three complete copies of the game out there in the wild. With one of the owners of these three copies once trying to sell the game for an undisclosed sum of money to people looking to preserve it. Unexpectedly, people didn't take too kindly to the attempt to make a quick bit of cash off a piece of gaming history, so talks dissolved, ending with the supposed destruction of the game and any files remaining of it by the angry owner. How much of this is true? I don't know, but there has been more claims of people owning the game and then losing it somehow, plus there has been prototype footage uploaded online showing the game in action, so the full version has got to be out there somewhere, right? I managed to find one of the leaked prototypes just to try and see how the game played out of curiosity. Now the prototype is very rough with only a single level called the mines to explore. You can see all of the dev info throughout the game and you can also access a debug mode by pressing the start button, but it was fun to mess about with those features for a little bit. The game itself looks pretty rough in this build, although as mentioned that is to be expected. Honestly though, controlling Superman isn't too bad. The camera is very close behind the character, but I had no issues moving around the level. You can also fly at will and it actually works kinda well, I'm genuinely surprised. The goal in this level at least is to explore the stage and rescue civilians in different rooms. Some of the rooms have a time limit where you need to kill the enemies and rescue everybody before it runs out. 
Once you do that in a room, you will likely find a switch, which will give you access to a new room, and then you go do it again. You can attack enemies with this janky punch combo or use one of your powers too. You have laser vision, a charge attack and freeze breath available, and they use some of these powers in interesting ways, like when you're trying to rescue an enemy from a cocoon, you need to freeze it first and then smash it open with your fists. Honestly, what's here isn't too bad. Sure, the prototype is pretty rough, there's not many areas to go and explore, but between playing what little is here and seeing the footage from the trailers and whatnot, this honestly might have been an okay game, certainly a whole lot better than Superman 64. Anyway, shame the final product got cancelled so close to release, but by the sounds of things there's a chance that a finished copy might end up on the internet someday, so I guess we can hold out hope, you never know. So in an alternate timeline, we may have actually seen a somewhat decent Superman game on the PlayStation, and I mean, there's still always the chance that it may eventually see the light of day. Do I think it would have saved the DC Legacy on the PlayStation? God no, you, you can't save that shit. Anyway, speaking of shit, it's time to move on to the last part of the video, ranking every DC game on the PlayStation from worst to best, or I guess in this case it's worst to least worst? Yeah. Honestly, this one is going to be pretty tough to call. Each of these games have a number of issues across the board, but there's got to be one winner. So let's get into it. Here is every single DC Comics game on the PlayStation ranked from worst to best. <sighs> man, I need to make a show where I play some fucking good games, man. Coming in at number four and taking the title of the worst DC game on the PlayStation, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker may at first glance look like an okay game, but between the repetitive levels, unbalanced difficulty and downright broken gameplay, this ends up being one of the worst licensed games ever made and one of the biggest stains on Batman's video game legacy, period. Number 3 is Batman and Robin, an incredibly ambitious game which does deserve some credit for the scope of what it tried to achieve, but Batman and Robin is genuinely one of the worst playing games on the PlayStation. All the good ideas in the world can't help a game if its core gameplay is a complete mess, and with bad character controls, janky combat and too many awkward fixed camera angles, Batman and Robin is a complete mess. Don't let the number 2 ranking fool you, Batman Gotham City Racer is not a good game, in fact, it's a very bad game. But the one thing I will give this over the previous two games is that there is a functioning game here. You can actually play this one. But with an awful open world, repetitive mission design and terrible driving controls, even though this game is playable, it's not something that anybody would ever want to play. When I first started playing these games, there was no way I thought Batman Forever the Arcade game was going to end up in the number one spot. Yeah, this game is kind of bad, but compared to the other games, this is nowhere near as bad as them. Sure, the gameplay on the screen is a bit manic, yeah, the combat system is a little awkward and confusing at times, the game is really short and the number of continues it gives you is a bit stingy, but you can have fun with this game. It's silly, it's bombastic and it's over the top. Beating up enemies with insane gadgets and combos is pretty fun, but just don't expect there to be much depth to the game outside of that, even by side-scrolling beat-em-up standards. Batman Forever the Arcade game is not a good game, but compared to the others, this is by far the best DC Comics game on the PlayStation. So yeah, if you're going to try at least one, you might get a brief bit of fun out of Batman Forever the Arcade game, but at the same time, you could also just not play any of them, and your life will be much better off because of it. Or just play Batman on the NES. That's the best Batman game. Don't at me. I'm right. As always, I'd like to thank you so much for watching the video. Your time is very valuable, and I'm glad that you decided to spend it here with me. Um, watching bad Batman games, I guess. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to let me know by leaving a like and comment below. You can check out the channel for more videos, and you can also subscribe to keep up to date with any future content I've got coming out. As mentioned earlier, the Marvel video is still currently in production, but I will have some smaller videos out in the meantime to tide us over until then. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I've been Sean Johnson, and I'll see you next time.